my colleague Matt Siri and my other colleague Sunan Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Aliya and Tahir Fat Sharqa and AWS and especially my colleagues for making this possible. Now today we have normally we have had two of my colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Rahman and Dr. Gavin. Unfortunately, we regret that Dr. Gavin cannot make it, so we will have only Dr. Rahman to present to us. Dr. Dr. Rahman, Rahman obtained his PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Exeter, UK. He is currently assistant professor at the American University of Sharjah in the Department of Arabic and Foundation Studies. His field of competence and research focus is classical Islamic literature in Arabic, Islamic jurisprudence, and theology, more specifically um, uh, in hadith and sunnah, both in, in a historical and context and contemporary expression. Um, Dr. Othman today will be talking to us about travel narrative and geography, case of Bukhari in the genre of Rihla, Fitor al Hadith. Please. Namaste, Welcome everybody to this morning's session. Uh, first of all, I would just like to uh, thank uh, the U.S. Agia, in particular my colleague uh, Dr. Muha, David, for and other colleagues who were heavily involved in organising this uh, conference. And again, I extend my thanks and gratitude to all of you for making this conference reach its fruition. <coughs> Uh, as you can tell everybody, I'm just uh, attacked by these antibiotics all week. So in case I go crazy, you know why it is. Uh, my uh, topic today is uh, travel narrative and hagiography, case of uh, al-Bukhari in the genre of Rihla the Talib al-Hadith. Islamic history is filled with uh, exemplary individuals of the Malik ibn Marwan, reformed the Arabic language and built the Dome of the Rock, Harun al-Rashid who built the House of Wisdom, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali who synthesized philosophy and Sufism into a systematic theology, Suleiman the Magnificent who greatly expanded the Ottoman Empire, and many other men and women could be named as among those who have shaped Islamic history, leaving a permanent mark on the tradition, and both pre-modern and modern scholars have devoted many pages to the recording of their biographies. Furthermore, in the field of Hadith and its sciences, the contribution made by Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari is also worthy of mention. <clears throat> the disparate geographical locations of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad after his death necessitated travelling for the acquisition of knowledge, and in particular hadith, which became a major topos amongst the early Muslim scholars. Among them, Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari played a key role in travelling to record the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad that is now embedded in his magnum opus al Jami al-Sahih, which has left a profound impact on the hadith tradition and the genesis of its sciences. Muhammad ibn Ismail, ibn Ibrahim, ibn Mughira, ibn Bawdizba, and Ju'fi al-Bukhari, a famous hadith scholar traditionist. He began to learn traditions by heart by, by at the age of 10, and seems to have been a very intelligent boy, for he is credited with having been able, at an early age, to correct his teachers. He had a remarkable memory, and companions of his are said to have corrected traditions they had written down from what he received by heart, or what he recited by heart. His most famous work is the Sahih, which took him 16 years to compile. It is said that he selected his traditions from a mass of 600,000 
and he did not insert tradition in the book without first washing and praying to Rakat, two units of prayer. This work, which claims to contain only tradition of the highest authority, is of the Musannaf type, which arranges the material according to the subject matter. When he was 16, Muhammad ibn Ismail left his hometown of Bukhara in Transoxania, present day Uzbekistan, with his mother and brother Ahmed on a pilgrimage to Mecca. The small party would have probably have attached themselves to one of the merchant caravans carrying luxury goods west along the Silk Road. Traversing the desert, they would have passed through the bustling garrison city of Mark before climbing the mountains to Sarakhs and then descending into the rolling green and gold valleys of Khorasan. They would have made a stop in the city of Naysarbu, its northernmost orchards lying against the foothills of the mountains. As they continued west along the northern edge of the Iranian desert, they would have passed through Bayhaq, the great commercial and scholarly center of life, before voyaging across the Zagros Mountains and descending onto Iraq. They may have stopped in Baghdad, the navel of the world, and a throbbing center of trade, scholarship, and political intrigue. They would have continued along the caravan trail, now crowded pilgrims across the North Arabian deserts to the rugged mountains of the Hijaz, skirting jagged ridges into space by yellow tracts of sand. They would have ended their journey where Islam began over two centuries earlier in the dry and rocky valley of Mecca. <coughs> Now, with regards to the concept of the rihla fi talab al hadith, the hadith literature reminds the reader or reminds the Muslim that the search for knowledge is intimately tied to the physical act of travel. In this regard, several themes recur in the principal hadith collections. Teachers and the learned as the only valuable human beings the high merit of seeking and spreading knowledge, traveling in order to gather it, and the possession of knowledge as a sign of grace, which reduces distinctions of birth and rank among Muslims. Providing was done for the right reasons, travel in the classical Muslim conception, to use Paul Hussle's words here, was conceived to be like study, and its fruits were considered to be the adornment of the mind and the formation of the traveler. <clears throat> the best known Quranic verse on the Rihla on this subject is, as you can see on the slide, everybody, which I will translate for you for there should separate from every division of them a group remaining to obtain understanding in the religion and warn their people on their return to them that they might be cautious. فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة ليتفقهوا في الدين ولينذروا قومهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحضرون. And from the hadith we have many, just one example here for the sake of brevity, that is, one who treads a path in search of knowledge has his path to paradise made easy by God. من صلب طريقا يلتمس به علما سخر الله له به طريقا إلى الجنة. Such a verse and the hadith elevate rihla fi talab al-ilm to the status of ritual obligation and stresses the care one must take in disseminating knowledge. The above mentioned verses of hadith emphasize the importance that Islam places on knowledge, its virtues, and travel in search of it. The search for knowledge as a theme and practice has dominated Islam and given Muslim civilization its distinctive shape and complexion. In the field of hadith, Scholars such as al-Bukhari undoubtedly traveled for the acquisition of hadith, but their motives were also beyond that. That is, when one studies the reasons for travel, we can establish the following reasons. The first is tahsil al-hadith, the acquisition of hadith. And number two, al-tathabbut al hadith or authenticity of hadith. Number three, al ulum fi Acquisition for elevation in the chain of narrators. Number four, al bahf and ahwal of what? Investigation of the lives of the narrators. And number five, mudakrat al-ulama fi naqdil ahadith wa'ilaliha. 
discussion with the scholars regarding the criticism and the defects of the Hadith. Given the intense interest in travel for the sake of scholarship and Hadith literature, it is no wonder that it became a normative feature of medieval Muslim education. Though local and regional traditions were always influential in shaping religious and intellectual life, medieval Muslims really knew no boundaries in their desire to master the subjects which comprise the canonical syllabus of learning. Among others, they included the Quran, Hadith, Tafsir, Qara'a, etc. Scholarly journeys were frequent and often long in terms of both time and distance. A man could study in 20 different cities with as many different teachers in each and return home yearning for yet another trip. As an example of which we have in front of us is that of Al-Bukhari. Furthermore, the information we have pertaining to Al-Bukhari is provided by works in different genres. In this respect, I would like to focus on four categories in chronological order. And if I can just say from the outset here, I mean, there are so many books written on the history of Islam, on the uh, bi biographies, on the Asma of Rijal, and also on the commentaries of this particular individual, but I've just endeavoured and I just kept it to a minimum here. <coughs> So, books of history, for example, as you can see, the <coughs> biographical dictionaries, the Babad and Tarajim, books of narrates of Hadith Kutub al and popular commentaries written on Bukhari's work of Jan al Sahih, the Shuhur. Therefore, this paper will discuss the personality of Al Bukhari as a major figure of Hadith, and more specifically, how he was perceived in biographical Hadith literature and subsequently, subsequently analyzed historical references. Thus, the objective of this paper will be to provide a chronological listing of the aforementioned sources and determine if the information provided is consistent or if it is the subject of embellishment by examining what details were included and excluded and how many discrepancies may be explained. The list, however, as I mentioned earlier, is exhaustive and an attempt will be made to cover the most important and principal works in these genres. So as an example, everybody, these are just some of the important works I've selected from the books of history and uh, Tabakhat and Zorology. And as you can see, I start with uh, the work of Al Khatib Al Baghdad, Tarikh Baghdad, and then moving on chronologically here to Tarikh Dimashq by Ibn Asakir, then Wafayat Al Ayyan by Ibn Khadikan, and then Tarikh Islam of Al Dahabi, and then Al Wafid Al Wafayat of Al Safadi and six al-Bidari wa nihayi wa ibn Kathir. Now in terms of the uh, narrates of hadith, the put of Asma of Rijal, again it's quite exhaustive here. I've tried to keep to a minimum for the sake of brevity. But these books, the Musbalah or Qutb of Rijal, Extremely, are strongly associated with the Rijal al Hadith, the, the reporters of Hadith. In scrutinizing the reporters of a Hadith, authenticating or disparaging remarks made by recognized experts, whether among the successors or those after them, we found to be of great help. The earliest remarks cited in the books of Rijal go back to a host of successors and those after during the first few centuries of Islam. Among the earliest works in this field are Tariq of Ibn Ma'in. The Babat of Khalif ibn Hayyat, Tariq al Bukhari, Kitab al Jahi wa Ta'adir ibn Abi Hatim, and the Babat Muhammad ibn Sa'ad. A number of traditionists made efforts specifically for the gathering of information about the reporters of the six famous collections of Hadith. Those of, of Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, and Nasa'i ibn Najah, giving authenticating and disparaging remarks in detail. The first major work. Such works include also the report of Ibn Majah is the 10 volume collection of Al-Hafid uh, Al-Hafid of Al-Ghani al As you can see, Al-Kamal fi Asma'i al rijal And later, his student, Al-Nizzi, uh, Jamal al-Din Abu al-Hajjad, Yusuf al rahman al-Nizzi prepared an edited and updated version of his work, but made a number of additions and punctuation of the names by names by places and countries of origins of the reporters. He 
He named it Tahdeeb al Kamal fi Asma al Rijal and produced it in 10, 12, sorry, 12 volumes. After Al Nizi, we have one of Al Nizi's gifted pupils and students, Shamsuddin al Dahabi, who summarized his Sheikh's work and produced two abridgments, a longer one called Tahdeeb al Tahdeeb and a short one called Al Kashif fi Asma al Rijal al Kutub al Sitta. As you can tell everybody by now, the, the, the books are very exhausting in terms of the, uh, the list. A similar effort with the work of Nizi was made by Ibn Hajar, who prepared a lengthy but abridged version with about one third of the original omitted, entitled Tahdeeb al Tahdeeb in 12 shorter volumes. Later, he abridged this further to a relatively humble two volume work called Tahdeeb al Tahdeeb. Now, in terms of the uh, commentaries written, now, in term, when I say commentaries, see, I'm talking about commentaries <coughs> on the work of the Hadith work compiled by Bukhari al Jan al Sahih. Now, I've selected the three popular Hadith works here, namely Fath al Bari by Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, the second one, Amr al Qari by Badruddin al Aini, and the third, Rashad al Sari by Asqalani. Now, Going back to the Tariq of Baghdad, Tariq of Baghdad by uh, Al Khadim of Baghdad. Now, what do these scholars do here? This is the discussion and this is the analysis. Now, we're talking about a Hadith scholar, Al Bukhari. How do they depict him in their works? Al Khadim's terminology begins with, for example, Rahala fi talab al ilm ila sa'il muhaddith al ansar. That's how he starts the discussion regarding Al Bukhari. Then he mentions Kataba bi Khurasan, Wal Jibal, Wa Mudun al Yawa, Kulliha, Wal Hijaz, Bashan, Wa Mis. Then he uses Walad, example, Walad of Abdad Dafat in Zahid Kalam. And this is how he depicts Bukhari's travels. Now, a century later, Ibn Ibn Asakir in Tariq Dimash, he does not mention Al Bukhari's account like Al Khatib. However, he specifies first. That Al Bukhari heard hadith in Dimashq, Samia bi Dimashq, then he provides a list of the cities Al Bukhari visited, example, Mecca, Hims, Asqalan, Alayk, Khurasan, Al Iraq, and Basra. Ibn Asakir is more specific than Al Khatib. However, there is a report which both works exemplify Al Bukhari's travels. For example, uh, Imam Bukhari's narration is attributed by where he says, Rubba hadithin samitahu bil Basra. كتبته بالشام ورب حديث سمعته بالشام كتبته بمصر. So both works provide detail of Bukhari's travels, acquisition, and status. However, there is no uh, embellishment, so there's no extra information. However, one is something than the other. Now, Ibn Khalifan later on, who references Al Khadim. Now, Ibn Khalifan in Wafayat, he, you can say, copies Al Khatib al Baghdadi. Word to word. So, <coughs> Ibn Khaldatan references Al Khatib, exactly the same words, Rahala fi talab al ilm in Asma'il Muhaddith al Ansar. But he provides very little account of Al Bukhari's acquisition of knowledge of hadith. Now, Al Dhahabi, in his Tariq al Islam, a century later, is as Al Khatib and Al Safadi. In his work al Wafi, has copied everything from Al Bafi, specifying the names of places where Al Bukhari traveled to. However, Ibn Kathir does not mention and specify in detail the places Al Bukhari traveled to. I mean, this is the difference now with the information we're getting. As you can see, some scholars, especially Al Khatib here, initially he provides the detail. Another scholar comes a century later, very succinctly. Scholars that later came on, they Pick and choose, and this is how we see the information about, uh, regarding Al Bukhari here, especially in the books of Dali of uh, Islamic history. Now, if you move on to the Qutb al Rijal or Qutb al Asma'il Rijal, we just talk about the, relate, the narrator of Hadith, Al Maqdisi, Abdul Ghani Al Maqdisi, writes the same information as the historian Al Khatib. So, Tariq Baghdad, the information put in there by Al Khatib al Baghdadi. Abdul Ghani al Nabdisi in his Al Kamal fi Asma'il Rijal again copies the same information. And this trend, and this trend follows with all the abridgments which came after Al, al Nabdisi's work. So Al Nizi, uh, Al Dahabi, Ibn Hajar, 
they all follow that same trend by being consistent in providing this information of Al Bukhari. Moving on to the commentaries, I'm bringing very simply here. Uh, amazing as one would expect. Now, the commentary of Al Bukhari, which is the famous Fatah al Bari by Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, one would expect Ibn Hajar to at least write something on the travels of Al Bukhari, but he doesn't. However, there is no mention of his travels. However, Ibn Hajar has written a specific work called Hidayat to serve a separate work altogether, which specially, which is specially devoted to the biography of, the, of uh, Al Bukhari, where he mentions the Rihadat and the travels of Al Bukhari. So, moving on to the other commentary by Al Aini, Al Aini, which is another commentary of Al Bukhari, which again uh, he was in continuous loggerheads, as they say, with Ibn Hajar being from uh, the Hanafi school and the Shafi school, but that's a different uh, discussion altogether. But he also wrote a commentary on Al-Bukhari. Al-Aini, who is also a contemporary, as mentioned, writes very simply, quoting Al-Bukhari. He just writes very simply about Bukhari, and what he does mention about Bukhari's acquisition and travel is one particular statement, which he attributes to Al-Bukhari, which is, أَقَمْتُ بِالْبَصَرَ خَمْسَ سِنِينَ مَعِي كُتُبِي أَصَنِّفْ وَأَحُجُّ كُلَّ سَنَةٍ وَأَرْجِئْ مِنْ مَكَّةٍ إِلَى الْبَصَرَةٍ خلاص, that's the only statement Al-Aini gives about the travel of Al-Bukhari. After Al-Qasqas Qallani, who writes in his Irshad al-Sari, provides us with a detailed account of Bukhari's travels as the Mu'arrikhim, the historians, which Ibn Hajar and Al-Aini do not do in their commentaries. So, just to... Uh, that was just to give you an idea of how different scholars in different genres have depicted a hadith scholar who is renowned within the Muslim world. However, what they do do is, and this is just how I like to sum up here, that they <coughs> all have provided this information with their chain of narration going to Al Bukhari, which is something unique in every genre. Some are consistent. Some are not consistent with the information, but what we do find is there is no embellishment of any extraordinary information about Al Bukhari. This is something which we will finally find in these works which have been written on this slide. Thank you for listening. <laughs> apologies, everybody, for the uh, disruption. Thank you, Dr. Man. The floor is open now for questions. Please don't raise your hands all at once. Just one question. Well, Ali, have you read the elements that you found in the book of the Sahara? I mean, in terms of hagiographical elements, they are, they are full with all this information. My focus was, was just on the Rehla here, but these books focus a lot on this issue, you will find that. But my specific point here was the Rehla itself, as you just noticed. But all these books, the Tariq, Asma al Rijal, they all, however, do copy the same information, but in detail. Thank you very much for that. Um, obviously, the, 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 the elephant in the room that you tried to analyze. I think uh, in terms of uh, the embellishment here, I mean, all, it, was, it was all to do with a man and trust in the knowledge these people are giving about a particular scholar. Therefore, they maintain that. Uh, and again, the acquisition of knowledge in itself, as you know, was a very important element of traveling from one place to another. Uh, but it's the finer detail as well, which these scholars, when they wrote the biographical dictionary, they were very uh, cautious about, especially when if they were supposed if they were giving wrong information, which would have been detected again. But they were very cautious in not providing such reports. So this is why uh, this consistency of information remained.
the world with books which were written in different genres. I think the element was, as you know, is the Aman, the trust, the surviving information, because uh, as you know, with the Isnad system, not only did it work in the Hadith, it also worked with the uh, <coughs> history. Uh, so any information which was provided was provided with the Isnad, and then the Isnad was then this was a, a separate uh, science altogether to detect whether this report is an authentic one or not. So it was still the same in terms of the Rehanat. Maybe, I mean, uh, this is another topic altogether in terms of the uh, who's the writer, mm. the historian, what are the aims behind the book. So that's a different topic altogether where if we were to read why these people uh, wrote about Khalid in this manner, what they wanted from one particular school of thought, one particular school of law, so these are other discussions as well. Next. Um, what I wanted to share is the discussion towards. Uh, Somewhat a shocking uh, way of thinking about uh, Abu Khalid. Uh, I wonder uh, whether you are familiar with uh, Ernst Heinlein's uh, highly controversial book uh, titled Sahih Abu Khalid, Nihai Postura. He's a Moroccan writer and uh, his book was banned in, in Morocco, but uh, Rashid Al uh, presented his book in International Book Fair of Tunis last year. And that also raised uh, a high controversy. And now, my point is that uh, Aydan speaks, Rashid Aydan speaks about strange things in a hadith of Bukhari which don't really correspond to uh, logic thinking and even the Quran itself. And he even questions the um, the reality of this book, I mean, as there is, he claims, <coughs> there is no original manuscript of Abu Khali's work. So, uh, is it uh, a book who wrote really this book? Was it the type of 1000 and all nights? Also, anybody, I mean, can do anything and claim it uh, and uh, Abu Khali's uh, words. And then, when it comes to travel literature now, and perhaps because I have uh, Israeli thinking, uh, travel literature has also its ups and downs when it comes to veracity and truth. So, if you place Abu Khalid's work within this tradition of traveling, travel law, travel literature, so this may also raise few doubts. As you uh, would appreciate, there's always been questions of authenticity regarding every literature we have in front of us today. Mm -hmm. uh, this issue you raised earlier about this particular Rashid. Uh, it's not a new one. Uh, yeah. It's not a new one. Earlier scholars, we go back to the school of uh, thought known as the Mu'tazila. They raised questions, not just on, uh, obviously they had certain questions regarding hadith generally, in, in specifically certain hadith in certain books. And Bukhari's was also one of these <coughs> works which was also a point of criticism, which starts from the classical period. So it's not a new issue. Uh, again, this is a different topic altogether. We talked about people like uh, Rashid Rila, Jamaluddin Afghani, later Egyptian scholars, who questioned the authenticity of certain hadith in Bukhari. Who also questioned, like you just said, about the actual whether it is Bukhari's work or not, because we know, and when we read uh, about Al Bukhari, and when we read the, uh, again, uh, the biographies, bi his famous shit is Al Firabari. Al-Shurubri is the only student from whom we actually get this particular narration or narrative from about the work of Muhammad al from others today. We have many other students, so the question mark is what's happened to the works of the other students? But these are all <coughs> questions which have been raised uh, and have been answered. That's not my discussion today, ultimately that's a different topic altogether. Again, in terms of travel, travel log, I'm not saying that a uh, Bukhari is an infallible person, or the information given to him from scholars after, they're all infallible. But this is the information we have in front of us in terms of uh, the, uh, the, his travels and his acquisitions. So that's the best I can do in terms of that. <laughs>
Um, thank you for your presentation. I was, I was lacking a statement whether you accept or not accept all information from the sources you quoted about the travel, about the Paris travel. So you said there are these, this information is connected to this now, so there is yeah. an authority standing for it, but, but your position, your position yeah. as, a, as a scholar, would you, would you accept everything? I mean, ultimately, Ian's, I haven't jumped into the, uh, for example, as you know, because uh, we've been a scholar in this field, the study of Islam is a different study altogether, which if we devote, then we may be able to sift out the using the current methods of analysis, like for example, if you were to use uh, Harold Motsky's you know, uh, thesis on uh, Islam from an analysis, I mean, we can basically um, use traditional scholarly uh, methods of Islam analysis, and we may, and I'm saying that the works are currently being done on this particular field, but we can imagine how exhaustive this task will be to analyze every report and the narrators. So, uh, I'm not saying I'm in a position at this moment to say that, yes, this is right, this is right, this is uh, inauthentic, and this is completely fabricated, but I do agree with you on this one. And that's another area which is uh, scope for study. To me, this would have been very insightful from, from your side as a specialist, you know, probably as a thought for another paper. For no, I appreciate it. Yeah, that's another thing. step forward yeah. in this particular area. Thank you very much. Yeah. So much appreciate it. Yeah, but checking the University of Islam, you don't really hear thousands of words on this. That's why you have the al you have the Dr. Ali. So this work has already been done. So when somebody is actually doubting the veracity of the Senate of one of <coughs> it has already been done thousands of years ago. And thousands of scholars have already done this work as well. So what is the point of doubting these narrations, especially when subsequent scholars who wrote about where Bukhari had gone had actually quoted from Smith that there is nothing about this. So they knew that this could not have been incorrectly uh, written because when you look at the chain of any Iranian narration, really, a chain of narrations, every single one of them had never been checked. The one of them you know nothing about, or very little about, they left on the floor. Or somebody drops from the chain, so this person you know nothing about, and then the even the hadith itself, regardless of the number of them, is not acceptable, because by the hadith, because by the hadith, and this. That's why I put this in by classification uh, of hadith. And the same applies to where can the Bukhari man have gone? But I have a completely different connection about the Bible. We don't seem to to know exactly what the details of the Rehla of the Bukhari. Uh, in my head, maybe because the Sahih work can uh, outshow everything else that went to his life. So maybe this is the reason that we didn't get a lot of information about what exactly happened. It's more the result of it <coughs> than the chain itself that really matters a lot about the Bukhari. And I totally agree with that because when we look at these sources, uh, they don't specify any detail. Uh, and again, these sources, <coughs> the language they use, for example, uh, Khadib says, you know, and then he also uses uh, language like Samia, and then he also says, these all have different connotations that we know. So well, there is no specific detail as to what was happening. However, there are specific works, for example, Tariq Nisabu or Tariq Mar, places written by specific scholars of that locality, which do mention to a point as to what was happening in that locality and when Bukhari came and what he did. But it's not exactly detailed. Okay, Dr. Rahman, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, thank you very much. Thank you.